Welcome to The Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo. Today's episode is brought to you by Amazon.com. If you like Amazon as well as The Humanist Report, you can support the show by bookmarking the Amazon link in the description box. And every time you buy something from Amazon, you support the show. So on today's episode, we have a ton of things to cover. We will be discussing more Bernie Sanders news, uh, Cecil the Lion. Uh, We will be discussing the presidential candidates of the 2016 election, such as Chris Christie and Hillary Clinton, because they've had some really not smart things to say lately. Um, Also, we will be covering more police brutality, as well as two more women who died in police custody. So we've got some really heavy stories to cover. Uh, It's going to be a long episode. We got a ton of stuff to push through. So I hope you all enjoy the episode. On Meet the Press, Chuck Todd interviewed Bernie Sanders, and he tried to spin a false narrative on Bernie Sanders when it comes to both gun control and the Black Lives Matter movement. But as you're going to see, Bernie Sanders was not having any of it. Good to be with you, Chuck. Uh, You're in Louisiana, so let me start with the tragic news there uh, and uh, get into the politics of it a little bit, uh, which is uh, having to do with the issue of gun control. A lot of Democrats, President Obama has expressed some remorse that he hasn't been able to make more progress on gun control. And you've continued to walk a a straddle a line here. You talk about uh, your your sort of pro-NRA votes in Vermont. Uh, having to do with being about Vermont, not about the nation as a whole. Chuck, Chuck, that's not what I said. I come from a state which has virtually no gun control, Mm -hmm. and yet I voted uh, to ban certain types of assault weapons, I voted to close the gun show loophole, and I voted for background, instant background checks. And what I said is that a nation, we, as a nation, we can continue screaming at each other, mm-hmm. or else we've got to find common ground. Well, what and is that? A, what well, is that? Because common ground is, what is for it? a start, universal instant background checks. Mm-hmm. Nobody should have a gun who has a criminal background, who's involved in domestic uh, abuse situations. People should not have guns who are going to hurt other people, who are unstable. And second of all, I believe that we need to make sure that certain types of guns used to kill people exclusively, not for hunting, Mm -hmm. they should not be sold in the United States of America. And we have a huge loophole now with gun shows that should be eliminated. There may be other things that we have to do. But coming from a rural state, I think I can communicate with Mm -hmm. folks coming from urban states where guns mean different things than they do in Vermont where it's used for hunting. That's where we've got to go. We don't have to argue with each other and yell at each other. We need a common sense solution. Um, you, You last night spoke at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Of course, uh, it's a major civil rights organization, a lot of history there. But I want to play, uh, I want to play a clip that you had uh, sort of a reaction last week at Netroots Nation Mm -hmm. uh, in a confrontation with the Black Lives Matter protest. I didn't have a confrontation. What I had was, I was there to speak about immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And some people started disrupting the meeting. And the issue that they raised was in fact a very important issue about Black Lives Matter, about Sandra Bland, about Black Black people getting yanked out of, in this case of Sandra Bland, getting yanked out of an right. automobile, thrown to the ground, and ending up dead three days later because of a minor traffic violation. So this is not a, you know, this is issues which is a very important issue, an issue of concern that I strongly share. Well, I guess it, there were some people who felt that you were being too dismissive of the protesters. No, I'm not dismissive. I've been involved in the civil rights movement all of my life, and I believe that we right. have to deal with this issue of institutional racism but this is what I also believe and speaking to the SCLC last night right. this is what I quoted Martin Luther King when he died when he was assassinated understood and was working on a poor people's march we have to end institutional racism but we have to deal with the reality that 50 percent of young black kids are unemployed that we have massive right. poverty in the America in our country and we have an un- unsustainable level of income and wealth inequality. The criticism that's come to you at this so is that your answer is always economic injustice no. and that um, many African American activists believe no 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 you've got to deal with race racism is a separate institutional racism is a separate problem from economic injustice. They are parallel problems they are absolutely correct. But as Martin Luther King Jr. told us, we have mm-hmm. to address both. We have to rid this country of racism. What we saw in Charleston, South Carolina, a few weeks ago, a guy motivated by hate groups who goes out and kills mm-hmm. black people because they're black. Sandra Brand being yanked out of a car, dying three days later for what? Yep. For minor traffic violation. But my view is that we have got to deal with the fact that the middle class of this country is disappearing 
that we have millions of people working for wages that are much too low impacts everybody, right. impacts the African American community even more. Those are issues that do have to be dealt with at just at the same time as we deal with institutional racism. What you just watched was Chuck Todd getting owned by Bernie Sanders. Uh, he called Bernie's votes on gun control pro NRA. Now, this is in spite of the fact that Bernie scored an F with the NRA, indicating that he is both anti-gun and uh, pro-gun control. So clearly, they don't like Bernie Sanders' policies. Now, what is his policies? Well, Bernie Sanders actually co took control of the situation and he stated, uh, no, I did vote to ban certain types of assault rifles. I voted yes on mandatory background checks and I voted to close gun show loopholes. Now, if you have a brain, you can surmise that all of these are not pro-gun or pro-NRA policies. So that was a really nice try on Chuck Todd's part to try to discredit Bernie Sanders, but clearly it wasn't working. Now, Chuck then turned to the Netroots Nation conference where Bernie was met with Black Lives Matter protesters. And what Chuck Todd tried to do was frame it as a confrontation, but Bernie stopped him by saying, um, no, I actually agree with what they are saying wholeheartedly. And then Todd then said that Bernie was being criticized for focusing on economic injustice. And that was true at the time, but Bernie has actually shifted gears to focus on both economic injustice and systemic racism. So again, Bernie Sanders had to correct Chuck Todd and say, actually, no, I've shifted focus. I think that the Black Lives Matter protesters made sense. I agree with them. And now I am trying to address their issues through policy. So that was that was a great takedown of a media hack that is Chuck Todd. So now, what is Chuck Todd's agenda? See, Todd thinks that Bernie is far left, and he really wants to discredit Bernie Sanders on issues such as gun control and institutional racism, so that way far left voters will think, hmm, well maybe Bernie Sanders isn't so liberal on some issues, so Hillary must be to the left of him on these issues, therefore I should vote for Hillary Clinton. But I mean, why does Chuck care about this? I mean, does he have a horse in this race? Well, he does actually. See, what he gains from discrediting Bernie Sanders is that he gets to protect the establishment. You see, Bernie Sanders is actually not a part of the establishment. Chuck Todd is part of the establishment, as is the rest of the media. So now Bernie wants to get money out of politics, and this would directly impact the bottom line of Chuck Todd's bosses. Now, seeing that Todd likes his job and Todd wants to keep his job, what Todd wants to do is maintain that job by ensuring that his boss's profits keep rolling in. So he can do that by discrediting any candidate that is not part of the establishment. So when the Koch brothers give NBC $2 million to launch an attack ad against the Democrats, or vice versa, when the Democrats do it as well, so Chuck Todd and all these other mainstream media outlets benefit from that and they get to keep their jobs. But guess what, Chuck Todd? Bernie Sanders is on to you and he's not having it. So if you really want to try to get him off of the issues, you're going to have to try harder than that because he's sticking to the topics and he's not going to fall for any of that. A new CNN poll shows how Bernie Sanders stacks up against the GOP's major contenders for 2016. And if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, then I think you're going to like it. So now compared to Jeb Bush, Sanders is at 48%, but Bush is at 47%. Compared to Scott Walker, Sanders is at 48% and Walker is at 42%. Now compared to Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders is at 59% <laughs> and uh, Donald Trump's at 38%. So that's a beating. Now I want to note that when you control for registered voters, it is the case that Jeb Bush does beat Bernie Sanders by one percentage point. But again, he's a Bush he has a lot of name recognition, whereas Bernie Sanders doesn't have that yet. Um, now, when we go to the methodology, the margin of error is less than three percentage points, and the sample size is 1,017 respondents, but 615 of the people polled were on landlines, and 402 people were on cell phones. So I would like to see... Um, how this would turn out if we threw more cell phones in the mix, because as you all know, I mean, the only people who really use landlines now are older generations. Um, so if you throw in more cell phones, presumably you would get more responses from younger people. And as we all know, Bernie Sanders' message resonates very highly with younger people. So the poll does have uh, general applicability, but I am interested to see how it would work out. Um, if you do kind of swap out some dynamics, if you put in more cell phones and whatnot, or even if you poll people more ways, such as on the internet. Now, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that Bernie Sanders 
can win a national election. Now, look, I've already said this a hundred times now. Um, when you compare all of his policies, they're right in line with the American people. They have majority support for almost all of his policies. So actually for all of his policies, um, the only ones that don't have majority support is his, uh, his stance on trade, but he has plurality support on those issues. So I also want to note that um, it is the case that his biggest challenge is going to be getting through the Democratic primary because Hillary Clinton is still beating him and everyone else as well. But we already knew that. We're not surprised. He's slowly but surely moving up. Now, Kyle Kalinske from Secular Talk, by the way, if you're not subscribed to him, you've got to do it because he's hands down the best when it comes to uh, political commentary. But anyways, he states that. Uh, yeah, it is the case that Bernie Sanders, his biggest challenge is going to be getting through that Democratic primary, and he's 100% correct to state that. The thing that a lot of people don't realize is that Bernie Sanders' message also resonates with a lot of uh, Republicans. So when you look at some of the issues, such as getting money out of politics, uh, support for the minimum wage, although many of the GOP candidates don't support these policies, while well, their constituents do. So it is the case that Bernie Sanders could win in a national election. Now going back to the polls, look. He's really close when it comes to Jeb Bush. They're, in essence, tied when you take into account registered voters. But, I mean, look, he's six percentage points ahead of Scott Walker. He's a lot. He's in the double digits ahead of uh, Donald Trump. So this is great news for Bernie Sanders supporters, and it just kind of goes to show that his his campaign is not going to stop with the momentum. He is really making some waves in this election cycle. In an interview with Vox, Bernie Sanders recently spoke out about our corrupt campaign finance system. Now here's a brief clip of that. Candidates are increasingly dependent on the very, very wealthy. And I'm proud, by the way, that the vast majority of our money comes from working people. But if I'm a normal politician who needs to raise $20, $50 million, where am I going to go? I'm going to sit down with the wealthy. I'm going to go to the country club. I'm going to do my fundraisers at fancy resorts. And I get to know those people. But that's the whole point of this corrupt pa uh, campaign finance system. If you're going to contribute a million dollars to my super PAC, well, maybe it's you're a hell of a nice guy and you like to participate, or maybe you want something. I think you want something. And you and I are going to become really good buddies so I can do your bidding. In other words, the millionaire class and the billionaire class increasingly own the political process and they own the politicians who go to them for money. And I worry very much, I, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, that we are moving very, very quickly from a democratic society, one person, one vote, to an oligarchic form of society where billionaires will be determining who the elected officials of this country are. I'm going to do everything I can to stop that. When you say you want to see elections be publicly funded, do you want to cut the ability to privately fund them? The first thing that I want to do is overturn the Citizens United the Supreme Court decision, which is a total disaster. Uh, free speech does not equal the ability of people to buy elections. And what I have said is, if elected president of the United States, any Supreme Court nominee I make uh, will make it very clear that he or she is going to vote to overturn Citizens United. Second of all, I think what you want to do is at least make sure that candidates who are running will have as much money as um, their opponents who may have unlimited sums of money. Uh, thirdly, I think there are various ways that you can approach the issue. One way, which I find intriguing, is that you either give a tax credit or basically provide $100 for every citizen in the United States of America. And you say to that person, here's your 100 bucks. You can make a contribution. You're going to get a $100 tax credit if you spend that $100 on any candidate you want. I think that would democratize very significantly the political process in America and take us a long way away from these super PACs controlled by billionaires who are now buying elections. So Bernie Sanders says, quote, we are moving from a democratic society, one person, one vote, to an oligarchic society where elected officials are controlled by billionaires. Now, I think it's already the case that we're already ruled by billionaires. And our system is at this point, in effect, a competitive oligarchy, because if you look at political science studies, such as one from 2014 um, from Dr. Gillens and Dr. Page, they find that our politicians don't represent us at all. And they actually represent special interest groups such as um, the NRA, such as billionaires, such as corporations. Um, so really, when it comes to our influence, there's no effect at all, but the effect of influence from corporations, that's statistically significant. Now, this is incredibly problematic. Other uh, studies are actually starting to show this as well. So now, if we were represented by politicians in Congress, then 
why is it the case that so many overwhelmingly popular policies can't get passed? Now, I'll give you some examples. Over 90% of Americans want money out of politics. Over 90% of Americans want universal background checks for guns. 63% of Americans believe in climate change, yet an entire party has been bought off by the fossil fuel industry and will not even admit that anthropogenic climate change is a reality. 95% want limits on coal-fired power plants. 63% of Americans want free community college. 60% of Americans support raising the minimum wage and want paid sick leave. Over 60% of Americans want paid maternity and paternity leave. 65% of Americans want infrastructure fixed. 67% of Americans are dissatisfied with income inequality, yet we keep cutting taxes for the rich and subsidizing large corporations. That doesn't make any sense. Now, 65% want to expand Social Security, and 70% don't want cuts. But what are Republicans talking about right now? Mm, well, we're going to need to reform Social Security. We're going to have to privatize it or do something because, I mean, it's running out. But that's not true. Currently, Social Security is solvent until... 2033 and as of 2016 social security will be solvent until 2034 and so on and so forth so this is a false narrative that the politicians just want to dip into that cookie jar so that way they can give more subsidies to their buddies so now getting back to the statistics 40 46 percent of americans and that's a plurality they think that free trade deals are harmful yet they ran these types of deals such as the trans-pacific partnership through anyway now, 54% of Americans support marriage equality, and Congress couldn't get it together to legalize it. They had to wait for the Supreme Court to do it. And that's just preposterous. Now, 75% of Americans, that's a huge majority, they say that the Iraq war wasn't worth the cost. Yet, surprise, surprise, we're still there, even under a Democratic president. 51% of Americans support a single-payer health care system Yet Republicans voted over 50 times to repeal Obamacare, which was their policy before. It was funded by, or excuse me, it was created by the Heritage Foundation, and even Newt Gingrich endorsed it before. So when you go through all these policies, when you look at the statistics and what the American people want, it's very, very clear that we are not being represented. We can't get even the issues where 90% of us agree. 90% of us want universal background checks. That's... Um, believe it or not, actually, it's 93%. And we can't even agree on apple pie that much. 91. Okay, let me, let me elaborate. So 91% of Americans approve of apple pie. 93% of them approve of uh, universal background checks for guns. But we can't get that. See, if more Americans are in support of something than apple pie, there's something fundamentally wrong with the system if we can't get it. So... Bernie Sanders is 100% right. We have to do something. So now what we need is Supreme Court justices that will overturn precedent, not just from Citizens United, but also from McCutcheon and Bucky v. Vallejo. Now, the best option is a constitutional amendment, which will mandate publicly funded elections. Now, the best way to do that is to go through Wolfpack. Their idea was inspired by Lawrence Lessig and is ran by Cenk Uygur of the Young Turks. And their goal is to go through the states to get a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics. Now, what they can do is if three-fourths of the states call for an Article 5 convention, you can actually circumvent Congress and codify a constitutional amendment that will be added to our Constitution. So that's really the only hope that I have at this point of getting money out of politics. But, um, I mean, again, at the end of the day, getting back to Bernie Sanders... He's 100% right, just like he is on pretty much every other issue. When asked about her position on the Keystone XL pipeline, Hillary Clinton, well, she pulled a Hillary, and she dodged that question like the Matrix. Yes, yeah, right there. Yes. As president, would you sign a bill, yes or no, please, in favor of allowing the Keystone XL pipeline? Well... As you know, I was the Secretary of State who started that process. I was the one who put into place the investigation. I have now passed it off as obvious, because I'm no longer there, to Secretary Kerry. This is President Obama's decision, and I am not going to second guess him, because I was in a position to set this in motion, and I do not think that would be the right thing to do. 
So I want to wait and see what he and Secretary Kerry decide. If it's undecided when I become president, I will answer your question. So I think that the reaction um, by some of her audience members kind of sums that up. <laughs> They're like, oh, Hillary, come on, just answer the question. Come on, these are liberal people. They're going to be against Keystone, just answer. But I mean, I don't know what they expected, because if you expect Hillary to answer questions and be frank with people, well, then you're at the wrong rally. Bernie Sanders' rally is next week. Go to that one. <laughs> so now the guy who asked her the question he asked for a yes or no answer, as if a politician would give a yes or no answer. And so I just found that hashtag hilarious. <laughs> oh, oh, that was bad. Mike, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Let's try to get that going. Tweet me with hilarious scenarios um, and I'll retweet them. <laughs> now, um, anyways, think about what she's basically saying when it comes to Keystone. Look, you want to know what my position is on this fundamental issue? Well, guess what? I'm not going to tell you. Do you want to know? Elect me. Okay. You, you, you think that this issue that's really important, that's politically divisive, you think that we're going to wait to get your answer until you're elected? That doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. What happens is you tell us the policies that you're going to put in place, and then we vote for you based on that. This is what Hillary Clinton always does. She did the same thing with the TPP where she wouldn't give a straight answer. And finally, when she actually did, quote, condemn the TPP, it wasn't unequivocal. And she was really vanilla on it. She was saying, oh, I think we could probably just get a better deal. Well, Hillary, we know what your position is on the TPP because during your tenure as Secretary of State, you were a champion for it. So don't give me that BS. And she's doing the same thing with, with the Keystone XL pipeline. Of course, she's going to be in favor of it. Of course, she's going to approve it. She's a centrist and center-right on many, many issues so now what her actual answer was she said quote if it's still undecided when i become president then i'll answer your question so what's the bottom line look if you think that climate change is an issue well then you should unequivocally condemn the keystone xl pipeline because this is really just black and white huffington post explains through 2050 keystone xl enabled production of tar sands oil would produce as much as 5.3 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Carbon Tracker's projection is within the range of the State Department's estimate of annual emissions, a maximum of 168 million metric tons, but it totals them over 35 years to demonstrate the pipeline's cumulative and long-term impact. It would be the equivalent of building an additional 46 coal-fired power plants, or roughly the average amount of CO2 that the U.S. emits overall each year. So clearly, it's going to exacerbate climate change. This is 100% evident. Now, what's frustrating is that this is supposed to be the, quote, liberal candidate. We have an entire party, the Republican Party, who just outright denies the existence of anthropogenic climate change. That is, that they don't think it's man-made. And our only hope at this point is the Democratic Party. But I mean, look, even they aren't really championing climate change. None of them, besides Bernie Sanders, has actual specific policies that they're going to implement to combat climate change. The Democratic Party only wants to stop climate change insofar as it doesn't interfere with the business ambitions of their corporate donors. Now, furthermore, the right has framed this as a jobs issue. Now, what's been found out is that only 35 permanent jobs will be created in the end due to the Keystone XL pipeline. But even if it was the case that thousands of permanent jobs would be created through this, well, that still doesn't make it right. Because guess what? Here's one thing that's more important than jobs. The environment. Because if our planet becomes inhabitable, then guess what? Nobody's going to have a job. Where do you expect to work? On Mars? It's not going to happen. We have one habitable planet that we know about. And that's it. So the environment should take precedent over the economy and jobs. So now, if you really want to know someone who's going to be straightforward with you, who's going to be frank, well, Bernie Sanders is that guy. Here's what he says about the Keystone XL pipeline. Let's talk about something the Republicans do want to get done. That's the Keystone pipeline. The right. House just approved it. What's the Senate going to do tomorrow? I hope very much that, uh, that we will not provide the 60 votes. And that... why? What do you have against the Keystone pipeline? Well, what the scientific community tells us, you, virtually unanimously, Allison, is that Climate change is real. It is already causing devastating problems. And if we do not transform our energy system away from fossil fuel, this planet is going to face some pretty serious problems. The idea that we would give a green light for the transportation of 800,000 barrels of some of the dirtiest oils in the world 
makes no sense to me. I mean, you know, the State Department has done all sorts of environmental impact studies and found that it would have no negative they impact. Were yes, I do know that, and they were very faulty studies. What they assumed is that if we killed the pipeline, the oil would come by rail. I don't accept that, and the people who did that study had a prior relationship to TransCanada. Bottom line is, the Republicans talk about this as a jobs program. Yes. Do you know how many permanent jobs are going to be created on this? How many? 35. Why? Why do you make it so? Because you, you're, you're defining it very narrowly. It's not just about in the making of the pipeline. It's what this oil will provide as commerce, how it changes our dependence on foreign oil. I mean, there's a lot going on. There is. But the Republicans refer to this often as a jobs program. There are 35 permanent jobs. If you want a jobs program, it might be a good idea to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, and our rail system, and start creating millions of jobs, not 35 jobs. So look, every day it becomes more and more clear, Bernie Sanders may not just be the savior of our democracy, but also the savior of our planet potentially as well. Bill Maher recently wrote a blog about money and politics, and this is what he had to say. A recent New York Times poll shows that almost everybody hates Citizens United, that 46% want to completely rebuild our campaign finance system, and another 39% want to fundamentally change it. How come there's no apparent clamoring for complete public financing of campaigns? Isn't it the only thing we can do at this point? We've tried nibbling around the edges. It's only made things worse. Now he adds, For politicians, I don't think the bar should be calling for a constitutional amendment overturning Citizens United. The bar should be calling for complete public financing. Citizens United is misunderstood. The root of the evil was there before it existed, and some other nonsense could easily replace it. Now, he's 100% right. Look, money in politics was already a problem before Citizens United, but what that ruling did was exacerbate it, and it pretty much opened the floodgate so that way now pretty much unlimited money can be poured into campaigns. So now, what's the best way to actually go about achieving public financing of elections? Well, hands down, it's Wolfpack. I haven't seen any other types of groups that really have a practical solution to the problem of money in politics. So now, what Wolfpack does is it's trying to enact a constitutional failsafe so that way if the national government gets too corrupt, well, the state governments can stop it from being more corrupt. So what happens is what you can do is you can call for an Article 5 convention if you get three-fourths of the states, that's uh, 38 states, I believe. Now, if you can get 38 states to um, sign on to an Article 5 convention, well, they can codify a new constitutional amendment and subvert Congress, and Congress would then be bound by this new constitutional amendment. So now the reason why we actually have to go through the state legislators is because they're not corrupt yet. I mean, sure, money in politics is kind of a problem in certain states, um, depending on the political context. But I mean, by and large, they're a lot less corrupt than our national congressional uh, legislator. So now... When you look at the way that elections are run in our country, going to the House, I mean, House members are elected every two years. So they're constantly in campaign mode. They're constantly thinking about how they're going to get more money, how much more donors they can attract. So, of course, they're not going to be wanting to worry about campaign finance reform because they don't have time to. Now, when you look at the uh larger Congress, including the Senate as well. So even if there's one um, politician that's inclined to get publicly funded elections through a constitutional amendment, well, if they propose it and fail, then special interests such as uh, billionaires, corporations, um, interest groups, what they're going to do is they're going to pour a ton of money into their opponent's campaign to make sure that that politician does not get back into Congress. So you're really damned if you do, damned if you don't in this situation. I mean, you could be in favor of a constitutional amendment to uh, publicly fund elections, but you better make sure that if you're going to propose that, it's going to win. So now, every generation at this point has passed a major constitutional amendment, except us. We haven't done that yet. And I think this is going to be our time. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to rally. We're going to have to volunteer. We're going to have to call our legislators and ask them to adopt the Wolfpack Amendment. At this point, I believe three states in total have uh, codified it. Um, but we've got a long ways to go, a long, long ways to go. Look, I know that you guys are concerned with like climate change and minimum wage and whatnot, and these are all extremely important issues, but the problem is that we can't even address these issues until we address money in politics because you've got to go for the one thing that's stopping all other legislation from getting through. I mean, if you want legislation on climate change, well, good luck getting through to Republicans because they're all bankrolled by the fossil fuel industry. All of their campaigns are paid for by and large 
by these types of organizations that want to um, that want to pollute, such as Coke Industries. So now at this point, I don't see any other feasible way to get money out of politics and to publicly finance elections than to go through Wolfpack. So if you guys are interested in that, check out wolf-pack.com. And you can actually become a volunteer. It's extremely easy. I've done it. I've called legislators. And they're actually a lot more receptive to the message of Wolfpack than you think. So give that a try. Check out wolf-pack.com. Because, again, I can't see any other way that's practical to actually get money out of politics. Sam DeBose is a 43-year-old African-American man that was pulled over by a University of Cincinnati police officer named Ray Tensing. And he was shot and killed. Now, Sam DuBose was not armed at the time of his killing. So now there's body cam footage of what happened, but I want to warn you that before I show you it, it's very, very disturbing and gruesome. So just watch this, but keep that in mind. Hey, how's it going, man? Hey, how's it going? Good, Officer you see police. Do you have a license on you? Yeah, what happened? What okay. Is this your car? Yeah. It's going back to the female, actually. Yeah, it's, 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 it's my, my, my wife, her name is... To read. Okay. We well, don't have a front license plate on your car. Oh, I, I can see my glove box. I have it. What's that? It's right here. I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's I, actually, I, that's got to go where the front plate's supposed to go. Well, I didn't know you don't that. have to reach for it. It's okay. I, you have a license on you? Uh, yeah. What's that uh, bottle on the floor there? Oh, bottle. Bottle what? Okay. Do you have a license on you? Okay. Do you know where that is inside? Is that or or what? Yeah, I got my my titles and stuff on that. Okay. I'm gonna ask you again. Do you have your license on? I have you? license. You can take my name. So you, do you not have your license on you? Uh, I'm asking you a direct question. Do you have your license on? Uh, I thought I'd be on screen. Why did, what did you pull me over for? Again. The front tag. But it's not even to have a front tag. Okay. Actually, it is. I'm going to ask you again. Do you have a license on you? I have a license. You can run my name. Okay. Is that not on you then? Uh, I don't think I have it on me. Be straight up with me. Are you suspended? No, I'm not suspended. Why don't you have your license on you? I don't. I'm just done. I'm sorry, sir. I'm going to go in the house. Okay. Where do you say that? Down here? Okay. Well, until I can figure out if you have a license, license or not, go ahead and take your seatbelt off for me. I ain't even doing that, man. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off. Stop! Stop! So now here's what happened. Um, Sam started to drive away and the officer alleges that he was being dragged. So now the officer after this was quoted saying, I almost got ran over by the car, but I timed it. It took 1.71 seconds from the time that Sam started his vehicle to the time that he was shot in the head. So I don't think you can get ran over that quick. And furthermore, we have the footage. We have the dash cam footage to show that you weren't about to get ran over. So now after that, you saw him running after the car after it kind of took off and he still had his gun drawn. But dude, did you not see that you just shot him in the head? Why is your gun still drawn? He wasn't armed. He didn't have a gun. He just started his car to avoid what could have potentially turned into a high speed chase. This officer took the liberty to just shoot him in the head. Not even give him a chance. Just shoot him right in the head. How does this happen in a democracy? How does this happen in the free world? I don't get it. Afterwards, the police officer was fired and he actually is being indicted on murder charges. So now Joseph Dieters, the prosecuting attorney, says Mr. DeBose did not act aggressively or pose a threat to police officer Ray Tensing and that officer Tensing had lied about being dragged by Mr. DeBose's car. A grand jury, Mr. Dieters announced, indicted the officer on a murder charge punishable by life in prison and a voluntary manslaughter charge. Now Dieters was quoted saying it was a senseless asinine shooting. 
This doesn't happen in the United States, okay? This might happen in Afghanistan. People don't get shot for a traffic stop. So now, um, seeing that he was a police officer for the University of Cincinnati, it appears as though the university is going to take charges to um, prevent this from happening. Now, they were quoted saying that they are going to take necessary steps to address any training, staffing, and hiring policy issues that may be indicated by this tragic event. So now, what's the takeaway from this? Well, I mean, look, the good news is that it looks like there may actually be justice for Sam DeBose. But the bad news is that it happened in the first place. So now the saddest part, which is the most devastating fact, I think, is that this was presumably a really happy time for Sam because the day before he was shot and murdered by a police officer, he got engaged. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about that. If you think somebody's breaking the law, pull them over, arrest them. Don't shoot them in the head. I mean, this clearly could have been prevented. And the cynic in me wonders, what would happen if we didn't have this body cam footage? Would the cop get away with it? Would he even be indicted? I mean, we saw a video where Eric Garner was choked out. He was just choked out. And the officer wasn't even indicted. So, I mean, what would have happened? Would there be any justice for Sam if it wasn't for this body cam? I don't know, but... For once, it seems like the necessary precautions and the necessary um, legal route is being taken. But again, what's sad is just that it happened in the first place. We still don't have an answer as to what happened to Sandra Bland, who, if you don't know, was a 28-year-old African-American woman who was assaulted by a cop, arrested for a minor traffic violation, and then later died a couple days uh, later in her jail cell. Now, since this case, there's now been two more cases wherein African-American women have died in police custody. Now, I'm going to go over both of those uh, cases' details with you. So the first one, um, it was a woman named Rakina Jones, who was a 37-year-old Cleveland woman and mother of one. She died in police custody two days after being arrested. So now she was arrested originally due to a domestic dispute, and her sister, Renee Ashford Jones, she said this, she was perfectly fine. She didn't complain of nothing. Nothing saying she was hurting or anything. She was fine. I'd just seen her. Then, the next day, they called and said she was dead in jail. They checked on her, but they won't tell us nothing. Now, at the time she was arrested, she did inform police officers that she does have several medical conditions, all of which require medication. But her sister contends that she was given all of the medication as directed. So... One of the guards stated that she looked lethargic in one of the days that she was in jail, and she was then transported to a hospital to receive medical treatment and then back to jail because her vital, her vital signs were normal. Now, when the guards checked on her later that night, she was unresponsive, and Ross Story explains, the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office performed an autopsy on Jones on Monday with spokesman Chris Harris stating there were no suspicious injuries to Jones's body and that further studies were needed to determine a cause of death. So really, it's an open question um, as to what happened to her. We have no idea. Now, moving on to the second case, uh, the woman was named Raynette Turner. She was a 42-year-old New York woman and mother of eight. And she also died in police custody. Now, she was originally arrested for shoplifting, and she told police that she was not feeling well. So they took her to the hospital also to receive medical treatment, and she was treated for high blood pressure. And once they transported her back to her jail cell, she was later found dead in her cell. Now, her husband didn't find out until her scheduled arraignment. So he was kind of out of the loop for a few hours. Now, he says, quote, no one said anything to me about my wife was downstairs dead. They just let me sit in the courtroom all day long, waiting for her to come and be seen by the judge. I'm not going to rest until I get some type of justice for my wife. That's the bottom line. So Rakina Jones was the fourth, and now Raynette is the fifth African-American woman to die in police custody this month alone. So, again, we can't necessarily uh, make any assumptions we don't know if there's foul play they were both treated for medical conditions we have no idea but what's important is that we say their names get their story out there so that way if there is any foul play 
hopefully any officers potentially involved in foul play will be brought to justice. But what matters, again, is just making sure that there's an investigation, there's an autopsy, and we uncover the truth because their families deserve to know. And it's just a little bit scary that five African-American women have died this month. Now, look, I'm not saying anything. I don't know the details. We all don't know the details. Their families don't know the details. But we've got to shine a light on it, and we've got to make sure that inmates are getting medical attention. We got to make sure that they're being treated properly. We got to make sure that they're monitored if they are having medical problems. So again, the whole point of this is not to make any assumptions, but just to shine a light on it. So a video of a police officer in Cleveland named Robert Schwab. Um, well, it went viral because in the video he was seen pepper spraying Black Lives Matter protesters. Now here's a clip of that. So now to give you guys a little bit of context as to what was going on, because we really see the video, but we don't have much context. Well, these individuals were leaving a summit for Black Lives Matter, um, and there were about 1,200 people in attendance. And what they were discussing was issues such as police brutality and institutional racism, ironically. Um, now, the crowd began chanting in protest after a black teenager who was part of the crowd was arrested. Now, the cop alleges that he was drunk, but this has yet to be confirmed. Now... Clearly, these people are just exercising their First Amendment rights, which is legal. <laughs> That's legal. This is the U.S. Um, now, they're allowed to protest so long as they don't get violent, and they weren't getting violent. Did you see anyone uh, breaking anything? Did you see them hurting anyone? No. Um, so now, clearly, the cop was the one who's in the wrong as he was being unreasonable. Now, the police department presumably agrees with that, seeing that he has now been placed on administrative leave. Now, you don't get to assault people because you feel a little bit of pressure because protesters want to take part in a nonviolent protest over something that they disagree with. If you can't handle that type of pressure, if you can't handle these types of crowds, then you can't be a police officer. I mean, you go through training to deal with de-escalation. You don't escalate situations by assaulting people, by pepper spraying them in the eyes, which is extremely painful. You can't do that if you're a police officer. It's all about de-escalation, not escalation. That's the goal. <laughs> so now what this demonstrates to me, what I kind of got out of this video is that a lot of people, they, they just don't care about Black Lives Matter protesters. They see them as a nuisance. What are you complaining about? Why are you rioting? Why are you doing this? Da, 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 da. Look, I don't agree with rioting, but I do agree that they should be protesting because they have a legitimate grievance. But everyone should be protesting because it's a problem that institutional racism is so entrenched in our system that it's everywhere. And now black people have to be terrified everywhere they go, even if it's just for minor traffic violations, about being assaulted by the police. Bill O'Reilly even re recently just said that the Black Lives Matter movement wants to tear the country apart. I have the video on that if you want to check it out. That just kind of shows that people don't care about the Black Lives Matter movement. And they're not outraged that police officers all across the country are assaulting African American people for no reason. Now, this cop was so annoyed because, I mean, I could imagine him thinking, how dare they be outraged by police brutality? I'm a cop. So let me, <laughs> let me pepper spray them and then use excessive force. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why he did this. I don't know if he has problems with racism, um, if he's had any race issues in the past. But again, he's overstepped the line, and I'm glad that he's placed on administrative leave. And I would like the, um, the police office in the county to wage an investigation on him because, look, with how much African-American people have been being assaulted and been getting killed by the police lately... Mm -mm. We can't just take this lightly. We really got to look into this guy, see if he has a history of racism, do like a psychological screening to ensure that he doesn't hold any malice or ill will towards minorities. Because look, he was clearly in the wrong. You saw the video. It's not okay to pepper spray nonviolent protesters. Bill O'Reilly recently decided to run a smear segment on the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, I'll show you the video and then we'll come back and discuss it. Who's funding Black Lives Matter? One of the big donors seems to be George Soros, our old pal, who gives big money to affiliates of Black Lives Matter, groups that do direct business with them. Also giving money directly to the group, 
entertainers Jay-Z and Beyonce. There they are. Joining us now from Washington, Kelly Riddell, an investigative reporter for The Washington Times. Is this just a fringe group, or should we take them seriously? Well, I think you got to take them seriously. I mean, look what happened to Martin O'Malley a couple of weeks ago at the Net Roots convention when he basically said all lives matter, was practically booed off the stage, and then had to issue an apology. I mean, well, he didn't have you. to issue the apology. <laughs> well, he, he chose to, but that's O'Malley's fault for even going to the Net Roots convention. And, well, and I mean, Hillary Clinton has been there before. A lot of Elizabeth Warren, a lot of um, liberal activists go to this on a yearly basis. I understand that, but but mm -hmm. I don't know whether this crew, black. Lives Matter have any constituency other than the radical left, the real fringe nuts that run around the country uh, saying crazy things. Have they made any inroads into a more established position? Well, I mean, you got to look at Black Lives Matter is really an umbrella slogan kind of uh, group that encompasses a lot of social justice um, workers um, and a lot of social justice organizations. And um, it's, it was a, it's a group that was started by three women that work at Soros-backed organizations that are into community organizing, um, into kind of riling up activists. And um, what all of these social justice groups have in common is basically three things. Um, the first is that they believe fundamentally that it's social policy and the man and the p professional political class that is out to get them with unjust policies, that basically all of their social woes, all of their economic woes can be, be, be based on unfair policies. Um, second is that they're very well organized. You have a bunch of different separate organizations that basically there's think tanks that put out the narrative. The narrative is followed by all of these organizations. They have Twitter. They have um, Facebook where there's, they create an echo chamber echoing, echoing each other. They've got police professional protesters that go to places like Ferguson, Baltimore, uh, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, to basically rile up whatever uh, the local vibe is there. And then lastly, they are all, all of these organizations from a certain standpoint are funded by George Soros's Open Society Foundation. Um, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I found that within one year, George Soros dedicated $33, billion, $33 million to these types of organizations. So they're really well funded. So $33 million mm -hmm. for Soros to agitators mm -hmm. who are um, organized to disrupt and then the National Convention for the Republicans in Cleveland seems to be a target. But mm -hmm. What about Jay-Z and Beyonce? <laughs> I mean, here, here are two extremely famous individuals. Mm -hmm. Do you think they know that giving money to an anarchistic group like this that wants to tear down the country and, you know, is talking about genocide and really, really extreme things, do you think they have any idea what they're doing? I do, actually. Um, one of the activists that said that Jay-Z um, and Beyonce were giving um, tens of thousands of dollars to the movement, um, her name is uh, Dream, uh, Dream Hampton, and she was a co-writer on Jay-Z's memoir. And she's part of this uh, Malcolm X grassroots organization um, that is very, um, is very extreme. And so she's part of their inner circle and was the activist that basically first reported that they were giving money because Jay-Z and Beyonce were getting a lot of flack from these groups for not, I mean, Jay-Z raps about it in his lyrics and, and they wear, you know, the memorabilia or the, the you know, the Black Lives Matter t-shirts, but they weren't giving any money and so, uh, so so yeah well, so they kind of got we've invited uh, Jay-Z and uh, Beyonce if they have a statement they'd like to make or come in and uh, explain why they're doing what they're doing we're mm -hmm. ready to receive them so now the first thing that stood out to me was how he exposed uh, individuals such as George Soros and um, Jay-Z and Beyonce for donating to the Black Lives Matter cause <laughs> that's not controversial they're donating to a good cause so you're not exposing them. And I love how um, he then was kind enough to invite Jay-Z and Beyonce on the show so they can explain themselves. Oh, Bill O'Reilly, are you not merciful? <laughs> how ridiculous is this? Now, moving on, um, he said that he doesn't know if they have a real constituency other than the radical left, which he calls the real fringe nuts that run around the country. <laughs> now, he's saying... Think about how I'm laughing because it's so ridiculous. What he's basically saying is that the people who are mad at state-sanctioned murder of a marginalized group, well, they're the ones that are nuts. Ugh, again, it gets worse. Kelly Riddle says that they go to places to rile up communities. Um, no, they're already riled up. The fact that people get upset 
when police officers kill unarmed black people. But they think that it's weird that people are upset about that. It blows their minds. They can't comprehend it. They think, why are they mad? They're just black people. We don't care about them. So why does anybody else? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that that's what they're saying, but it really sounds like it. Now, again, I'm extrapolating, but it's what they're saying is problematic. Now, moving on, Bill O'Reilly referred to them as, quote, agitators. So what he's saying is don't get mad at police brutality. Don't get mad at the police who kill unarmed black people. Get mad at the people who are mad at people dying. Get mad at the people who are trying to stop state sanctioned murder. How crazy is that? He's, in effect, blaming the victims. Now, he called them anarchistic and said that they want to, quote, tear down the country. So now let's actually look at the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. This is from blacklivesmatter.com. So their demands are to seek justice for the family of Michael Brown, to develop a network of organizations and advocates to form a national policy specifically aimed at redressing the systemic patterns of anti-black law enforcement violence in the U.S., they want the federal government to stop supplying military weaponry to police departments and wants the police to be demilitarized. Now, they want the attorney general to release the names of officers who have killed black people so they can be brought to justice. They want to reallocate funds from law enforcement offices, some funds, by the way, to combat poverty in predominantly black neighborhoods. I don't see what's extreme about that. These are all perfectly reasonable demands. So they're not about tearing the country down. They're about building the country up so that way it's more equitable. And so that way marginalized groups such as African Americans don't have to worry about being shot or assaulted by the police for routine traffic stops. Here's what's problematic about Bill O'Reilly. He thinks that these demands aren't reasonable. He thinks that they're the extremists. Well, here's what I think is extreme, Bill O'Reilly. I find it extreme that black people have to be scared for their lives if they're pulled over for speeding. I find it extreme that cops can be filmed choking and killing Eric Garner and not even be indicted. I find it extreme that police pulled up to a 12 year old with a toy gun and shot him within seconds. I find it extreme that African Americans only make up 13% of this country yet account for 31% of all people killed by the police. I find it extreme that in 2014, 238 African Americans were killed by the police. That's less than the amount of African Americans who died in 9-11. So if you're not outraged by this, if you're not outraged by these facts, then you're the one who's the extremist, Bill. These aren't isolated instances. These are common occurrences. We have a real systemic issue. The country is plagued by institutional racism, by state-sanctioned violence. These are all very, very big problems. Now, Bill O'Reilly wouldn't see this, though, because not only is he white, well, he's straight. He's rich. He's a Christian. He's at the top of the social hierarchy. He doesn't have to care about these issues because they're never, ever going to affect him. But I mean, you don't have to be ignorant to the facts because the facts are out there. These cases are widely reported on by all of the media. The problem is just that he doesn't care. Now, the fact that he calls the Black Lives Matter movement extremists and that they want to tear down the country. Well, that says a lot about his character. A popular lion named Cecil, who is a local favorite among um, individuals in Zimbabwe, was recently lured out of the Hwange National Park and shot and killed by an American dentist from Minnesota named Walter Palmer. Now, as you can see from the video, Cecil is a local favorite because he doesn't mind the tourists and he's a very beautiful animal overall. So now what happened? Walter Palmer paid $55,000 to hunt in a hunting zone next to the Hwange National Park, which is an animal sanctuary and you can't hunt there. And he lured Cecil out with meat shot him with an arrow, but then wasn't able to actually successfully kill him with that arrow. So then he stalked Cecil for 40 hours and ultimately shot and killed him with a rifle. He then skinned his body and then took his head, presumably to mount it on his wall. Now, what's problematic is that this isn't the first time that Walter Palmer has been in trouble for hunting illegally. Huffington Post explains, Palmer has come under fire for his hunting techniques. In 2008, he was placed on probation for one year and fined $2,939 after lying to federal authorities twice about where he shot a black bear in Wisconsin. So now here's some gruesome photos that he's taken with other animals that he's murdered as well. Um, yeah, so you kind of get the idea of what type of character we're dealing with here. 
So now Cecil's death has sparked international outrage. The Yelp page for his dentist office has been flooded with negative reviews. And he's actually since closed his business altogether. Now, he did release a statement about all of this. He says, To my knowledge, everything about this trip was legal and properly handled and conducted. I relied on the expertise of my local professional guides to ensure a legal hunt. I deeply regret that my pursuit on an activity I love and practice responsibly and legally resulted in the taking of this lion. Right. I don't believe him. I don't believe him because this is the way that it probably went down. Now, I'm just speculating, but I'm sure he saw Cecil in the Huanj National Park and he was thinking, I want that one. So he knew that it was illegal to kill Cecil because he was living in the sanctuary. So what he did was he lured him out with meat to get him to come out. And then once he got out, then he probably thought, oh, look, now it's perfectly legal. He's not in the sanctuary. I can kill him now. That's how it probably went down, given the fact that he is he's been in trouble before. So look, I don't believe you. Now, full disclosure, I don't think that hunting is inherently evil. I mean, indigenous hunting, among other animals, is just a part of life. And I mean, if humans are going to hunt and eat the animals that they kill, well, then I think that's probably more humane than um, the way that we eat animals that are uh, mass-produced in factory farms where they're kind of squashed together in these small pens and where they're lifted up by machines by their legs and their throats are slit. I think that just hunting them and uh, humanely killing them is more humane. So I'm not just outrage against hunting um, when it comes to that. Now, if you are a sport hunter, there's no excuse for you. I think that's just a deplorable act. I mean, if you think that you're just in hanging animals' heads on your wall, well, then there's a name for individuals of that with that type of behavior. They're called serial killers because that's wrong and that's what you are. Who would want to do that? I mean, look, this guy spent $55,000 to kill Dude, you could have bought a PlayStation with Cabela's Big Game Hunter for under 300 But, I mean, look, that wouldn't satisfy your bloodlust. You had to go. You had to fly across the earth and pay $55,000 to kill someone. It just, it honestly blows my mind. It blows my mind that people do this. Now, here's the problem that I have with these big game, game hunters. A lot of them try to justify their actions by saying, well, look, the money is going to help local villages. Okay, well, if that's the case, then donate the money to them. Why does the killing have to be involved? If you're such a humanitarian, put your money where your mouth is and just donate the money to help out the local villages. Why do you have to kill? It's because you want to kill. You like killing. You don't care about life. You're anthropocentric. All you care about is yourself. Here's the bottom line. This guy didn't kill Cecil to help the local community or feed a village. He wanted to hang Cecil's head on his wall. Now, Walter Palmer has since gotten death threats and has been met with harsh international criticism with people um, from people all over the world. Now, I want to encourage people not to send him any messages. Don't give him death threats. Two wrongs don't make a right. So here's what you can do. You can direct your anger in a manner that's more constructive. So what I'm going to do is put a link in the description box to a whitehouse.gov petition. And what this petition does is it urges uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and Attorney General Loretta Lynch to extradite him to Zimbabwe so that way he can face justice for his actions in Zimbabwe, which is the country that he committed the crimes in. So he does need to be prosecuted. I'm I'm in agreement with those people because if he's not pro- prosecuted, then this isn't going to deter other people from doing this type of heinous act. Spore hunting is wrong. Killing is wrong. This guy didn't have a justified reason for it that was acceptable. So in the end, he should face justice and be prosecuted for his actions. If you live in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, or Alaska and enjoy using legal recreational marijuana, then look out because Chris Christie is going to be coming after you if he's elected as president. At a town hall meeting in Newport, New Hampshire, he said, quote, if you're getting high in Colorado today, enjoy it. As of January 2017, I will enforce the federal laws. And now he described the legal marijuana laws as, quote, lawlessness and said, if you want to change the marijuana laws, go ahead and change the national marijuana laws. Now, it's a fact that marijuana is still technically illegal at the federal level, and it's still classified as a Schedule 1 drug, meaning it's more dangerous than meth and heroin and has no accepted medical use. But we know that that's bogus. I mean, this is classified as a Schedule 1 drug, even though it's been proven by studies that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol, and also that less people have died from marijuana overdoses than caffeine overdoses. But you don't see anyone trying to ban caffeine, do you? So if you think that this is an acceptable categorization, well, then you're just unreasonable. That's just, 
That's just true. So now furthermore, like all Republicans, Chris Christie, he likes to tout himself as a pro-states rights kind of guy. Now, he was quoted in March of this year saying it was the states that created the federal government, not the federal government that created the states. We need to get back to that philosophy. Okay, <laughs> well then take your own advice. See, Pew Research finds that 53% of Americans want recreational marijuana to be legal. And when you control for generational differences, 68% of millennials want pot legalized. Now, millennial voters often turn out in higher numbers during the presidential elections, so they could potentially sway the election. So now with these facts in mind, this is not a winnable position. And this is a civil liberties issue. But I mean, Chris Christie has proven time and again that he's anti-civil liberties. When you look at his stance on the NSA, he is anti-Edward Snowden. He's uh, pro-spying. Um, and look, to be fair, Barack Obama has the same position. But I mean, that's not okay. If you tout yourself as a pro-states rights kind of guy, well, then you should be in favor of these legal marijuana laws. Because again, marijuana doesn't hurt anybody. You can't ban things that you don't like. If they're not hurting anybody, if people aren't doing things to other people that are harmful, then it's not a problem. I could see if people were forcing other individuals to smoke marijuana and strap them to a chair and sticking a blood in their mouth, but that's not what's happening. That's not the case. So look, overall, this is just stupid. And so much for being a principled states' rights kind of guy, right, Chris Christie? Because I mean, if you're pro states' rights, then be consistent. See, I've already stated before, I don't care. I'm states' rights on some issues, and I'm and I'm pro-federal government on others on other issues. I don't care. As long as I get the policy position that I think is just, that I think is effective, then that's what I want. But at least I stated. You see, if you want to be consistent, if you tout yourself as a straight shooter, well, then don't contradict yourself. Planned Parenthood is currently under attack by a group who has purported to reveal a bunch of sting videos who uh, supposedly reveal a scandal, um, but there's not really a scandal. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you a clip from one of those. Back up a little bit. PPFA, our parent body, is on board with tissue donation, but we have to ask for a waiver to do it, and we have to lay out for them what our program's gonna be like. And the mechanics of it was that uh, Heather, uh, Heather Genics person would come to the site and our staff would sign the patients up and get consent and then Heather would look at the tissue and take what she, she mm -hmm. required. So it was logistically very easy for us. We didn't have to do anything. So it was compensation for this. We didn't have to do anything. So it was compensation for this. And the, there was a discussion as I was leaving. They, they had been paying by the case and there was some discussion about doing it in a different way. Or I don't know what you're used to doing, how are you used to doing compensation. The patients don't get anything, of course. But. Okay, so I'd like what what would uh, what would you expect for intact um, tissue? What what sort of compensation? What sort of? Well, why don't you start by telling me what you used to pay? Okay, I don't think so. I I'd like to I would like to know what would make you happy. What would work for you? You know, in negotiations, the person who throws up the figure first is at a loss, right? So, <laughs> you, no, I, I don't look at it that way. I know you want to play that game. I get I it, but I no, no, wanna, no. I want lowball because I'm used to low things from. You know what? Um, uh, if you lowball, I'll, I'll act pleasantly surprised, and you'll know it's a lowball. Okay. What I want to know is. Uh, what would what would work for you? Don't lowball it. Okay. Tell me what you really. Oh, that's way too low, I, I, and that's I, really that's way too low. I don't. Yeah, I, I want to keep you 50, happy. I've, I've been in places that did fifty too. But see, we don't. We're not in it for the money. So why don't you start by telling me what you used to pay? Oh I no no no! I want lowball seventy five dollars a specimen, and we don't want to be in the position of being accused of selling tissue and stuff like that. On the other hand. There are costs associated with the use of our exactly. space and all that kind of stuff. So what yes. would you think about? Right. So now when you look at that, you can see it's very clear that they're framing it very deceptively. They're editing it in a way that um, tries to take the individuals in the video um, out of context. And they're really trying to make it seem like Planned Parenthood is harvesting organs and selling tissue to profit off of it. But that's not really the case. What these alleged scandals are covering 
is um, fetuses being donated for scientific research. You can't just throw human tissue or a fetus in your trunk. It actually has to be transported by professionals in a manner that's safe, in a manner that can maintain it. So there are costs associated with that. Now, there's no scandal. <laughs> but nonetheless, conservatives are going to use this as ammunition to defund Planned Parenthood. Now, The Hill explains Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is fast-tracking a bill to cut off federal funding for Planned Parenthood after senators huddled in his office Tuesday to work out the details of a bill. The Republican leader told reporters earlier Tuesday that Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa would be leading a working group of senators, which also included Senator Rand Paul, to come up with a new bill. Now, here's why this is problematic. Here's why we don't want to defund Planned Parenthood. Well, they're not just this abortion factory like conservatives like to make it out to be. Here are some of the other services that they provide. They provide HIV counseling, treatment for STDs and STIs, cancer screening. In 2013, they did 400,000 pap tests and 500,000 breast exams. They also offer birth control, which is extremely important if you want to prevent abortion. And they prevented 6 million unintended pregnancies. Now, these are beneficial mostly to socioeconomically disadvantaged women, so the poorest of the poor. Now, abortion only represents 3% of their total services, and only about 10% of their clients have actually received received an abortion from Planned Parenthood. Now here's a chart that illustrates just how little abortion makes up of their total services. Now the kicker is that there aren't any federal laws that allow for the funding of abortions. So your federal tax dollars are not going to paying for abortions. Planned Parenthood is funded through Title X and Medicaid. Now Fact Check explains Title X funds may not be used in programs where abortion is a method of family planning. Medicaid funding is restricted by the Hyde Amendment to only abortion cases involving rape, incest, or endangerment to the life of the mother. Some states use their own funds under Medicaid to go beyond that. 17 states and, until recently, the District of Columbia pay for medically necessary abortions. According According to the Guttmacher Institute. So at the end of the day, Planned Parenthood provides very important services to poor women. And abortions, again, they only account for a small portion of Planned Parenthood services. The good news, though, is that this is probably not going to come to fruition as Obama can easily veto, veto it and uh, Democrats can block it. But again, at the end of the day, just know that Planned Parenthood is not primarily about abortions. Sure, they do do abortions, but what they are about, by and large, is women's health. Now, if you defund that, you're showing women that you don't care about them. But we've already known for many, many decades that Republicans don't care about women. So this is a non-issue. It's not a scandal. But this group is going to do anything and edit it in a very deceptive manner to tout their agenda, which is to defund Planned Parenthood. Well, that's the end of this episode. I want to welcome all of my newest subscribers to the channel, as usual. And I also want to thank all of the sponsors of this show, such as HostGator, Audible, Amazon, and Abe Books. Um, feel free to check those out. There's links in the description box, and you can save on them um, just by being a Humanist Report uh, customer or subscriber. Um, so anyways, I will see you guys next week. Take care.